All right, so now we've got a 100 gram ball on a 60 centimeter long swing that's being swung in a vertical circle about a point that is 200 centimeters above the floor. So let's, let's go ahead and draw that first to make sure. I think you may have a picture in your notes, but let's just make sure that we understand what's going on here. So we have a point that is 200 centimeters, so two meters above the floor. And then there's a string coming out of that point, which is 60 centimeters, that's 0 0.60 meters. And then the ball is swinging in a vertical circle. Doing my best to do a circle. That's not all that bad. All right. Uh, that seems like it kind of fits what we're talking about there. All right. Um, it says the tension in the string when the ball is at the very bottom is five newtons all right so at the point when the ball is down here the tension is five newtons okay now other than that we don't really have any other information it says a very sharp knife is inserted to cut the string at the bottom of the swing and so somewhere around here there's a knife that's going to slice the string when it's at the bottom. And the question is, as the ball comes around and swings around, when it gets to this point, how far is it gonna travel before it hits the ground? Now, hopefully you're looking at this excitedly and you're saying, wow, this is amazing. We've got circular motion and two-dimensional kinematics. This is like the best ever. All right, so let's see if we can figure this out. Now, of course, it is circular motion. And remember the first thing that we do when we have circular motion, we say, what is the centripetal force? So let's look at the ball here. We're going to do a free body diagram on the ball. What are the forces acting on the ball when it's at the bottom of the circle? Well, we've got the force of gravity down and we got the tension up. Okay, now I did draw the tension longer, that's for a reason, because the ball after this, if it was still attached to the string, it would go up again, which means that the upward force must be greater than the downward force. Now, at this point, we do have to make the decision of what is the centripetal force. Well, they both are, right? They are both in the direction of the center of the circle. And you may say, yeah, but gravity is opposite. Yeah, but it's along that same axis. And so it contributes. In fact, when we do the centripetal force here, it's going to be the tension, which is upwards. And we're gonna subtract off the force of gravity because that's downwards. And that will be the centripetal force. Now the centripetal force is upwards. So I'm gonna leave that as positive. You do have to be careful about the direction of the centripetal force. If you make your centripetal force positive, then only the forces that are in the direction of your centripetal force should be positive. All the others should be negative. So just the same as when we were doing our normal force stuff, everything has to be very closely paid attention to all those positives and negatives. All right. So now we can start trying to figure out some information. Obviously, in order to figure out how far it travels, we're gonna to need to know how fast it's traveling at that point, right? That's gonna be my initial horizontal velocity for that parabolic motion there. So obviously that's gonna come from our FC, so that's MV squared over R. The force of gravity is going to be MG, and then the tension they actually gave us, right? That was five Newtons at the bottom. So I'm just gonna leave that. So now I've got everything in that I can. I'm ready to start putting in some numbers. So the tension is five. The mass is 0.1, it's 100 grams, times G, which is 9.8, which is then equal to the mass, which is 0.1. Now, a lot of students are like, well, can't we just cancel out those masses? No, because if you divide by M, you've got to divide the tension by mass as well. There's a minus here, which means that these are two individual terms. If you divide or multiply, they both need to be divided or multiplied. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave it. We're going to have the V squared there over the R, which it gave us was that 60 centimeters or that 0.6 meters. So at this point, we should be able to solve 
for v squared. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So if we do the five minus the point, point 0.1 times 9.8, multiply by the point 0.6 on the bottom, divide by the point 0.1 on the top, we end up with v squared and we square root it. You should do this math. But to keep the video short, I ended up getting that V equals 4.9 meters per second. There we go. So now we know the speed that it's traveling at the bottom in order for there to be five newtons of force. Now keep in mind that this is the speed for five newtons of tension. If I were to go faster, then I would need a stronger, right? If I went faster, there would be a higher speed there. And then that would mean that I would need a higher centripetal force, therefore more tension to hold the ball swinging around, all right? Now, at this point, the knife, remember, cuts the string right here. And so my ball is not two meters above the ground because the center was two meters above. That makes this 1.4 meters, right? Two meters minus the 60 centimeters of the radius. So 1.4 meters above the ground, traveling at 4.9 meters per second horizontally. And so now we're going to do some two-dimensional kinematics. So let's go. All right, so let's make our table for x and y, and we're gonna have our x naught, x, v naught, v, a, and t. So x, I'm just gonna say is zero right here, and I'm looking for that horizontal distance. The initial horizontal velocity is 4.9. The final horizontal is gonna be 4.9 because there's no acceleration as we go horizontally, right? There's no horizontal forces. We're ignoring air resistance. Now, unfortunately, I don't know the time, so that's gonna end up being a problem. So I'm gonna end up needing the Y information. And so Y is going to start at a height of 1.4, go down to the ground at zero, it has no initial vertical velocity because it's traveling horizontally at the bottom of the circle there. I don't know its final vertical velocity, but I do know that the acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second. And hopefully I can use that information to solve for the time. So I need something that doesn't have final velocity, that does have time. So pretty good bet that we're gonna use the x equals x naught plus V naught T plus one half A T squared. And X then was zero. X naught is 1.4. The V naught was zero plus one half times 9.8, negative 9.8, because it is downwards, and then times the T squared. So that should then allow me to solve, by t, solve for T squared. I'm gonna do the 1.4. I'm gonna divide it by 0.5, divide it by 9.8, and I get 0.2857. And when I square root that, I get that T equals 0.5345 seconds. That I can now take and put into my X, which I'm going to need to find the distance in the X direction. So this was, remember, all vertical here. Now I'm gonna use the horizontal information. Again, I'm gonna use that same equation, the x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. Or you can just recognize that distance over time equals the speed, because we do know the speed, which is that 4.9. Initial position is zero, acceleration is zero. So our final x is going to be equal to the initial velocity 4.9 times the time, which was that 0 0.5, three, four, five seconds. And when we put all that together, we get our final answer, which is 2.6 meters. There you go. And so we've got the distance. That's a great question. It's got some vertical there, got some horizontal there, and hopefully it's helpful. All right, 